Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. So today we are talking about religion and divorce with Amy Pettyjohn. She is the author of amysjournal.com and a content creator on social media at The Divorced Christian. For several years, she was a stay-at-home mom and a leader in her church, and after 14 years of living in an unhealthy marriage, she made the decision to go against everything she was raised to believe in her Christian faith and got divorced. Now she's on a mission to help others who feel alone, stuck, and are caught up in their own religious views, to help them see that not only can they be divorced, but their faith can still find a way to serve in their life. And it's time to end the stigmatism of divorce in churches and take off the scarlet D. So welcome, Amy. I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, thank you, Renee. Thank you so, so much for having me. So one of really the common it. questions that I receive, I think I get a message or two every single week from a specific, particularly a woman who says that she is in this really unhealthy relationship, but it goes against everything that she was raised um, to believe about marriage and that a lot of times I even hear like there's family members who are in ministry and have just, you know, said that they'll shun her if she gets a divorce. So um, let's just first kick it off. And if you can share like your own religious background and what role it played in the decision that you made. Sure. And I relate so much to those kind of messages because that was me. I was raised to believe that divorce is never an option, never an option, and that God hates divorce. And so when I got into a marriage full of just sexual immorality and sin and lies, and then I just felt stuck. I felt like there was still no way out because divorce is never an option. And so I stayed for a really long time and, um, and I was stuck there. And so it took me a long time to get to a point of understanding really what God's love means for me and grace and mercy and what the Bible really says about marriage and divorce and that mm -hmm. there is a way out of that and it's okay. And so it took me a while to get here, but once I got here and I really discovered God's grace and how much he loves me and doesn't want me to you know, to be in that kind of situation, then I was able Did to Did you have, have any external pressures trying to talk you out of getting a divorce? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny when you're in a church situation, you can be, you can be an addict, you can be an alcoholic, mm -hmm. but you can't have problems in your marriage and in a church. And that happens so often. So there's really nowhere to go. So you kind of keep a lot of things secret and you kind of keep you know, what's happening in your marriage to yourself. Um, but also when I did start talking about divorce, absolutely, there was some pressure. Um, and I know my parents are okay with me talking about this. My parents were mm. a big part of that pressure. They wanted me to stay. Um, when I, the day I filed for divorce, yeah. got a phone call from them and it, and it just was hard. My parents and I went through a lot of growth together in my divorce. Um, and that's why I know they're okay with me saying that. You know, my mom constantly now apologizes for mm -hmm. the way that she handled it. Um, it was very hard for my parents. And uh, and even before my dad passed away a few years ago, it was something that, you know, him and I had gotten to forgiveness on. And um, there was a lot of healing there as well. But, yes, I had a lot of pressure to stay. About three years before I actually filed for divorce. No, I'm sorry, four years before I filed for divorce. Uh, my now ex-husband and I went through a separation in 2011 and nobody knew about that. I didn't even tell my siblings, but there was a lot of pressure to stay then. And that's when I was just like, I'm mm. stuck. I got to stay here. I have small children. It's against my religion. I have to stay. And then four years later, I was just like, I just can't do this anymore. It's just not. What was the turning happening. point so, for you? Like, what was that moment where you said, you know what, it's it's, this isn't going to work no matter how I've been raised or what I've been told about divorce, like there, I'm going to do something against the grain. I think the turning point for me, honestly, is I had a friend in the church. She was a leader and she was mm -hmm. going through some abuse in her marriage and she confided in me with that. And I remember sitting at the restaurant, I can 
tell you, we were in Olive Garden and we were sitting there one night and she was crying to me. And I just said to her, I'm like, why are you staying? Why are you staying? God is still going to love you. He's still going to love you. You could still serve. And as the words were coming out of my mouth, Renee, I've been never being like, why are you saying all this to her and not yourself? Why is it okay for somebody else and not you? And so, and that was literally, I think, the turning point in my life when I started helping Mm. another woman go through some of the things that I was going through. And I was telling her all the things Mm. that I wish somebody was saying. So how did you end up reconciling that um, you can still have a relationship with God and have faith and be divorced? You know, um, honestly, I delved into the Bible probably more than before. For my divorce. I mean, when I was in this marriage that was unhealthy, I, I did turn to God a lot. People are like, oh, you're not mm-hmm. trusting God enough to save your marriage. You're not trusting. And I was just like, you don't understand. I'm reading my Bible all the time. I'm doing all these Bible studies. I am. I am praying all the time. I can show you piles of journals where I'm like crying. Um, but after I finally let go of being the quote unquote perfect Christian and feeling like, Oh, I have to do everything right. When I finally let go of that burden, I was didn't even realize I was carrying is when I really delved into the Bible more. And I found scripture to kind of back up how I was feeling and that. And I mostly focused on that God doesn't expect mm-hmm. us to be perfect. And I was really just focused more on scriptures that talked more about his love than about all these rules that get very confused in the Bible. You know, everybody can look up scripture to back Mm -hmm. up anything they want to find, you know? So I was more focused on the scriptures that talk more about how much God loves me and how much grace he has for me. So where is the disconnect? Do you think that, is it an interpretation thing where people are, um, who are saying that divorce is, it doesn't happen and you shouldn't be doing it. Are they not reading the same parts of the Bible that you are, or are they just glossing over it? Or are they interpreting it differently? Like where, where do we think, and you've been a leader in your church. So I'm just curious, like where the disconnect is that one that you found some proof that, um, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. you get to make a decision that, um, is in alignment with who you are and is right for you. And you're not going against your religion because of that. Right. So I think what happens is that we get caught up in certain scriptures. You know, there is a scripture that old um, translations said, you know, Mm -hmm. I hate divorce, says the Lord. And that's in Malachi 2.16. But for some reason, people aren't reading the scripture above it and reading the scripture below it, where in that scripture, God is talking about men do not abuse and do not commit adultery against your wife and take care of her and nurture her. And I think we get caught up on just having Mm. to be perfect. I mean, there are scriptures where Jesus says, you know, except for sexual immorality. And you can say that to somebody and a person that's just so hung up on these, like other scriptures to say, you know, where two become one and, and no one should separate that except for God. And you're like, okay, but over here, it says, Jesus says this, you know, and they're just like, well, mm. God can restore that and God can be faithful to that. So, and again, like I said at the beginning, it's like you can have other quote unquote sins. You can be a drug addict, you can be an alcoholic in a church, but don't get a divorce while you're in a church. And it's, I, I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of legalistic Christians tend to put a lot of weight on certain, they categorize sin. Mm. We're not meant to categorize sin, you know? So even, let's just say they were even right that divorce is a sin, who says it's the mm-hmm. most important thing? Right. Who puts that there? People do. Humans do. And we have no right to do that. God didn't, didn't give us the power to categorize these sins and say, okay, this is a sin and this is sin. You can't do those, but you can do these over here. No, sin is sin. So even if they were right, are they perfect? Mm. Because I doubt they are. You know? So I just, I think that it, it gets we have this like we get into these church leadership roles and we tend to think there's some power there to what we can condone and what we can't or 
what we can accept and what we can't. And it's just, it's can just I not. ask you what you mean when you say legalistic religious views? Can you just explain that? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. So legalistic Christian views, um, you know, I, I wrote I, on my blog, I wrote a letter to Anna Duggar. I think she's one of the best examples um, to use in the situation. And they just, uh, legalism in churches were, are just so hung up on perfectionism and you can't do this, you can't mm. do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And they forget to be preaching about God's love. They forget to be preaching the greatest commandment of God says to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love one another. And and instead mm. they focus on rules. You just can't and and I grew up that way. I grew up in a church that was all focused on all the rules. All the rules. But where was the love? Yeah. They they forget mm. about that's so process. interesting. I grew up uh, Catholic and I'm not practicing now. Um, but one of the experiences that I had when I was going through my second divorce, um, was actually going to confession in a, a moment that was, I was actually in Paris and Notre Dame and walking into confession and at this, like I was in complete despair and turning to the priest and saying like, like help, like what, you know, what do I do? And I'll never forget the answer. And it was, you stay. You stay no matter what. And that was, I think that ended my re my relationship with a formal institution of religion. I consider myself extremely spiritual mm -hmm. and faithful, but in terms of that actual religion, mm -hmm. like that did, I walked out of there and I said, you know what? Mm -mm. I'm like, that's, that's, that's not, it's not the right answer. It's not, you know, to stay in something so bad and just because of the rule. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's crushing. And I imagine, yeah. and I didn't grow up in, in the same type of, um, religious background that you talk about. And so like my heart really goes out to people who do grow up where there's such a strong influence of that in their lives. So what do you tell a woman who um, is sitting in your, the shoes that you sat in and said, I can't, I can't do this because it's wrong according to what I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've had a few women reach out to me and again, I think of mm -hmm. Anna Duggar cause I know she's stuck there. She's stuck and I feel bad for her. And I, I wrote her a letter that I, I posted it on my journal as well to just say, yes, you can, you can, because they don't realize that they're holding on to perfectionism. They're holding on to this idea of being the perfect mm -hmm. religious person. And we're just not called to be perfect religious people. We're just not. It's, And so I would tell them if somebody came to me, and, and like I said, I've had people come to them, I'd just say, you know, find scriptures that reinforce mm. how much God loves for you. And find scriptures that let you know that it's okay. It is okay. And unfortunately, if that means that you have to leave your religion, like you did, you know, Renee, and I see that so often. I see a lot of, you know, especially when we're talking about women, leave their religion, leave their faith, leave these things because they're so bogged down by all these rules. So I would say to let go of the perfectionism, just focus on how much God loves you and the grace that he has for us and that he wants us to have healthy relationships. We're not the only people in a relationship, unfortunately. And usually when it's when it's somebody that feels like they can't get divorced, they're usually not yeah. the person that's sinning in the marriage. They're usually the one that's trying mm. so hard while the other one is not. And so they, you know, a person has to take a step back and look and say, I have done everything. I have given this to God. God knows my heart and I can't make the other person allow God to redeem them and allow, they have to make that decision. But until they do, it's okay for me to say. So what's going I'm on with her. Anna Duggar? Cause I haven't followed her. Um, I know who she is, but I really haven't um, followed. Is okay. she real, a reality TV? I'm so sorry. I know. I just always assume everybody knows the Duggars and I, yeah. Um, they were the reality TV family that were mm -hmm. uh, I think 19 kids in County. And I believe it's the show. Um, and Anna Duggar is married to the oldest Josh, who has been arrested ah. for child pornography. He has been arrested for, but years ago he confessed to mm. molesting his sisters and, and the babysitter and, 
Yeah. She stood by his side. And now the recent charges against him are child pornography mm -hmm. and several, several counts of child pornography. And she stays by his side. And Jim Bob and Michelle, you know, are praying for them. And, and there's that message that, mm -hmm. Anna, you need to stay. You need to stay and stand by your man and help him get help and help him heal. And yeah, that's not her responsibility. Right. It's just not. Her responsibility now is those children who she needs to now protect um, yeah. and herself. And it's okay. Unfortunately, they're so deep. I didn't grow up in such a deep yeah. environment like that, but it was close. But she's so deep in that religion where she just honestly feels like the best thing she could do is mm. stand by her man. And that's just, yeah. she's not responsible for Josh. She's not. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. So after your own divorce, did your relationship with your church change? Yes, I eventually did leave my church. Yes, I was, um, I was actually asked to step down from leadership roles in my church. And I know my former pastor would be so mad for me to say that, mm -hmm. but the truth is the truth. Uh, because I remember the meeting I had with him and he's just like, I want you to take some time. And I was a leader in about three different areas. And, um, He's like, I want you to take time. I want you to heal. It seemed like it was like about that. But then my ex-husband <sighs> was not asked to step down from any of his leadership <sighs> positions. And I wrote a letter asking, why am I, why am I being told I have to step down? And he's not, and there was no response. And, um, but I will say his wife, the pastor's wife, she actually, she came up to me one time during church service and just said, you know, she was very, very compassionate and it was very nice. But unfortunately, there were some other leaders in the church that all of a sudden I was shunned. I remember standing there. It was Easter service. I was standing there with my children and wow. nobody talked to me except for two people. And I was just like, wow, do I have my big Scarlet D on? I didn't, you know, yeah. I didn't put it on today. I didn't think I needed to wear it, but apparently I did. And it's a shame because there are divorced people in that church, but they came mm. into the church divorced. And I got divorced while I was there, while I was serving, and they didn't know what to do with me. So I felt very, very outcasted, very not welcome there. And um, oh, that, so that's that's heartbreaking. And do you think yeah. that anyone who sits in your shoes and, and has that same struggle about divorce versus what their church is saying them should be prepared for that being the outcome. Is it inevitable? Unfortunately, I do think it is. And it's a shame because I do remember my pastor saying to me, I hope that you don't leave. This happens a lot. You know, people leave when they get divorced. I hope you don't leave. But then there was no, there was nowhere for me to go. And I wasn't, felt to be very welcome there. And then, like I said, I was asked to step down. So um, I do think, unfortunately, if you are, you know, if a person is looking to get divorced and they are in a church, I think that that is one of the things they should prepare themselves for is that they will more than likely leave their church. They will more than likely not, it, it'll be awkward. They'll not know where they fit in. There'll be judgment. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think it's something that is inevitable that they will leave. And I've had a few people reach out to me from my blog saying, oh, you know, same thing. I was in my church for so many years. And after my divorce, I just couldn't go there anymore. And I had to find a new, a new home. And, I, and I'm thankful for them that they found, mm -hmm. you know, a new place to go. I have not yet. Um, it took me a while to yeah. heal from that rejection. And so I started trying to find a new church, but I have a big mm -hmm. wall up sometimes. You know, when it comes Has to Has it changed uh, your relationship with God, though? I would say it's actually made it better, honestly, because I've let go of trying to be perfect, and I'm just more focused on that individual mm -hmm. relationship with him. So um, I think it's actually made my relationship with God and my faith better. Because I can just focus on that and not all the drama yeah. and, the, <laughs> and the judgment, unfortunately, in churches. I think churches are a great thing. I did go to a church for a little while with my current boyfriend. He was going to church. And I went to his church for a little bit. But unfortunately, we left there due to schedule changes. But, um, but 
Yeah, I think it just really gave me that I have to be very intentional. I don't just open my Bible on Sunday morning. I open my mm-hmm. Bible every day because I'm very intentional about my relationship. And my family, like I said, there's a lot of healing within my family. Um, my sisters and my mom and I, we do a Bible study together. So I do get that fellowship in a church, not in a church environment, but fellowship with other Christians talking about Bible stuff. Um, just not in a, in a and building. And so your your family building. made peace with it because I do know that a lot of uh, a lot of the women I hear from will say that their family members have put so much pressure on them to stay. I'm just curious how that played out. You know, it's really um, my parents and I did a lot of work to heal together. It is something. I mean, I could have said. Mm forget you and just walked away from my parents or they could have said the same thing to me. Um, But I'm thankful that my parents, that even though they had these religious holdings on that, um, still valued me as their daughter and me as a person. And we focus more on our relationship and healed. Um, My mom now, you know, like I said, she Mm -hmm. apologizes to me for the way she reacted to that. So I do think if if family truly loves each other and there's that parent-child relationship or brother-sister relationship that is struggling because of somebody's divorce, um, that love can bring those those people back together if you don't give up on each other. And I don't mean that in a marriage way. Yes, that is too. But I mean in 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 a family way, if you don't give up on each other and keep pushing then and just sometimes you might even have to just say okay we just disagree but right do you love me as a person let's just focus right, on that right right you know? i mean it's not so yeah my parents have come a long way unfortunately like i said my father passed away about two and a half years ago but even before he he passed mm. he had come a long way as um, well when you were going through your struggles uh your marital struggles when you were st- when you were still married did your church suggests that you go to counseling within any of the officiants in the church. Cause I have heard of that, of like marriage counseling being done by a clergyman. And I'm always just kind of curious about the, um, the qualifications, the, you know, the, the influence. And it always seems like when I have clients that have done that, it always seems like the message is to really stay like you stay no matter what you, and it's, you know, and it's, it's almost kind of like jam down the couple's throat. And, you know, the couple of, of people that I'm thinking of who have shared that story with me, um, all said that they had to stop doing that and they had to start getting counseling outside of the church. And that's when they started to start to have a little bit more clarity about what it is that they wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, we kept our issues in our Mm -hmm. marriage, such a secret. And um, even now, I don't go into a whole lot of detail yeah. about the, the details of our marriage um, for my children's sake. But um, so we really kind of kept it as a secret. And when it was time to tell, because we were in leadership and it was time to tell the leaders that we were getting divorced, my mind was already made up. Honestly, at that point, so sorry, I looked like a train. Um, my mind was already made up. And I remember my pastor saying that to me. She said, I could tell your mind is made mm. up and there's no... There's nothing here for us to do. You know, there was some leaders in the church that asked if we would join them for some uh, dinner Mm -hmm. and some marriage counseling with them. And I denied that um, because I I was already beyond that point. And um, and even my ex-husband, you know, for years I had asked him if we could go to counseling and he never wanted to. And then. After I filed, mm. he asked if we can go to counseling. And I said, I mostly just wanted to go yeah. so that we could be on the same page about right. how we were going to tell our children. And um, and she didn't. She's like, your mind is made up. So I've never experienced that leadership counseling in a church. But I do have some friends and I know some people that have gone through those same experiences that you mentioned, where it becomes very you are saying yeah. there's no, right, it's right. not counseling. It's, it's more of, um, mm-hmm. it's more of you're staying. How can we get to, you know, we need you to understand that you're staying. And it's more of a, yeah. it's more of a yelling at them and not really counseling them. And I usually do recommend to people to not go to yeah. 
their pastor for counseling. I recommend finding a therapist. And if faith is something important to you, then to find a counselor with faith, because there are counselors out there as well that I, my therapist in particular, I went to therapy for a very long time. And that was one of the things that I looked for. So I knew that she was a Christian and I knew that her and I could speak about my faith and she could give me scriptures but she also was a therapist and she believed in mental health and she believed mm. in helping me on a personal level and not just here's your Bible, stay, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I recommend to go to a, yeah. to a licensed therapist and not yeah. a church. Uh, so let's talk about Amy's journal that you started it. And uh, when did you start it? Why did you start it? And what is it all about? Okay. So I actually started it a few years ago and then I kind of put things on hold for a while. So, but about, mm, about eight months ago, I really revved it back up and came back to it. And I really feel like God is just calling me in this direction to help other Christians out there that this is a thing. This churches do put a big scarlet D on our chest. And a lot of people are stuck in a very unhealthy marriage and feel as if they're going to be disobeying God and feel like there's just no way out for them. And so I wanted to start this to help other people of faith that are going through hard times, going through the option of divorce, going through these types of things to help them understand that one, you're not alone. Cause I felt so alone for so long. And that was probably one of the hardest parts is feeling so alone. Um, so I wanted other people out there to know that you're not alone. And I just wanted to relate to them on this level. I don't feel like there's a whole lot of yeah. talk about mm-hmm. Christians getting divorced. If you Google it, you'll find a lot of scriptures on on it. And usually it's those scriptures of God hates divorce, but you won't find a lot of encouragement and help out there. And so I just wanted to be a source of anybody that has faith and is feeling stuck that they can find some comfort. And some Are you, do you usually share. share your own personal stories and experiences? I usually share a lot of my own thoughts. Like I said, mm-hmm. I usually keep the details of what happened in my marriage uh, private, but, um, but I share a lot of my feelings. It's mostly about going through the change of letting go of the perfectionism, letting go of the rules and focusing on yeah. my faith and focusing on life after divorce and not necessarily what was happening in the marriage, but healing Mm. and divorce. And how do we find that? Um, I'm on social media under the divorced Christian and there's links on there, or you can just go straight to amysjournal.com. I also have a subscription as well, where I try to send out emails when I post new blog posts and send out some free gifts things like that. So amysjournal.com or on social media. Amy, how long have you been Christian. divorced now? Um, it's been, <laughs> where are we in 2020? <laughs> and so, over you know, years. one of the common questions that I always receive is how long does it take to heal? Do you have, and I think it's such an individual response for everyone, but in your experience, how long did it really take you to heal and um, come out the other side of it and say, okay, I'm going to be okay. Sure. You know, it's funny. I actually remember sitting with my GYN and he said, Amy, um, most women tell me about five years and they're in a better place. And I was just like, five years. My God, that seems so long. Um, but, and he meant more mm. of like co-parenting and things. And that was really accurate. And I'm thankful that my ex-husband and I had gotten to a really good co-parenting relationship even earlier than five years. Um, that is a really individual thing. I think it depends on how much time you put into it and what you need to go through. I know for me, once I got divorced, it was literally, um, I'm free. And I just was like, I'm free of all the rules and I'm free of everything. And I needed to have a little bit of a rebellious time. Um, and then that kind of brought me to yeah. my knees <laughs> about a year and a half later. And, um, that brought me to my knees and that's when I really delved into the healing part of divorce. So, It's funny, I met a really wonderful person about three and a half, four years after my divorce. I met somebody and um, I thought I was 
I was great. I'm healed. I'm doing so good. Da, da. And then you get, get into a relationship. You're like, oh, well, hold on. This bothers me. This bothers me. Yeah. There's a few things you don't realize are there. So you're, you're relating with them another person so i do think it's an individual thing i do think it's important to put yeah. the time and the effort into it um i had commented on one of your posts renee about one of the best things my therapist ever said to me was you know do you want to be alone in your marriage or do you want to be alone forever you need to make a choice because no guarantees and when i had realized that and i thought to myself i want to be i would rather be alone than mm -hmm. to be alone in my marriage and that's when i really think that's when the initial healing began. And then post-divorce, I really started delving into that. But I actually started healing from some of the things that were happening in my marriage yeah. before I even left, which is what gave me the strength. To it's me. not linear. So, I think that, you know, the expectation is that there's like this end point and then you say you're healed and now you move on. And I think that that's not the way it works. Things can come up. Triggers can come up years after and you've moved on and you're happy oh, and um, you still have things that come up. And I think that's so important to keep in mind and just kind of have some grace with it, too. Yeah, I, I usually yeah. relate it to grief. So, you know, somebody can be gone from your life for years and you feel like you're doing okay and then that grief button just gets hit. And I think the same thing yeah. kind of happens in divorce. Like you, you, like you said, you could be healed, you could be moving on and then something happens and just kind of like triggers an emotion. So it's just yeah. a matter of don't stay there when that happens. You know, experience it, feel it and kind of delve into it a little bit. But Realize that it's normal to have feelings. Absolutely. Pop up Amy, what is in your future with the work that you do and the mission that you have dedicated your energy to? You know, I want to keep using um, this platform. I want to grow it. I want to keep writing. I have a few things that I'm working on I, as far as writing goes, um, devotionals, mm -hmm. Things like that. So I'm really just looking to just continue to grow Amy's journal and the divorced Christian to get my voice out there and to just keep using that and head in this direction. But I do have a few projects that I'm working on as well to hopefully take it to the next. Your level voice my is so needed and it is so necessary because there are so many people out there who are feel ashamed or they're afraid to take that next step and they need to hear from someone like you who has gone through it all and come out the thank other you. side. So thank you for the work that you do. It is selfless and beautiful. And I know that your message is landing with people who absolutely need to hear it. So thank you for being here for this Thank interview, you. I am so grateful. I've been like chomping at the bit since I started this podcast to have one talking about religion and divorce. And it's really hard to find someone who wants to talk about it. So I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, asking so me. I'm Thank so you for excited. being just so yeah. vulnerable and open about your journey. Oh, thank you, Renee. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for, for wanting to do this because it's important that people realize they're not alone and there's a lot of us. Absolutely. There, you know, so thank you. <laughs>